Well, hello everybody, it's great to be back in Manchester and reading in this wonderful gallery with my colleague Darren and the wonderful musicians we just heard. Um, like a day out in itself, really. I'm going to read some poems from my new collection, Europa, and then some work written since then. And perhaps illustrate what uh, Jeffrey was referring to in his introduction about the world we live in. The first poem is a pretty brief, it's called You Are Now Entering Europa. Can everybody hear me okay? Is, is it clear enough? Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of Lars von Trier's early film Europa, you see a view from the back of a train uh, pulling away over tracks in black and white. And you hear the incomparable voice of Max von Zidow doing the voice of saying, You are now entering Europa. You are now entering Europa. The grass moves on the mass graves. How many divisions has the grass at this discreet perpetual exercise? The fallen leaves are frozen now. The wind falls bitter. No one writes, and I forget. I mark the days. The grass moves on the mass graves. I tell myself I have my work, when what I have is paper and a clock. The grass is in the street. The street is at the door. I may not be disturbed. You understand I have my work. So near to its conclusion now, that I will never finish it. The grass is at the door, is on the stairs, is in the room. My mouth is me. While I mark off the days and think how blessed I am to have my work, to tend the graveyard I become. This is Link Boy. A Link Boy, uh, as people may well know, would carry a torch or a lantern through the foggy, smoky streets of cities for people needing to find their way around. And the Link Boy, whether in the 19th century as I think of it, or closer to our own times, speaks this poem. I have spent my life here, sir, in the long 19th century, making my way as I must. Tall as masts, the curlicued railings surround the great tomb, the night magnet for thin shanked grave robbers. Rain gives consumption and syphilis back to the soil where the saddle nosed grave diggers bend to their labour, then climb into the flooded pits to reinter themselves alive. Here, even the toadstools that burst like buboes from the earth are iron-clad. Defended with gallows and gunpowder, England's necropolis conquers the ocean and drains it. The world is this island concealed in the fog of a triumph all bow at the name of great death. At noon, sir, in this pitch black street, I am your faithful link boy, with my dark flame raised before me, a farthing, sir, yes, to extinguish. <coughs> Last year, uh, I became the first member of my family to be able to visit the grave of one of our relatives who died on the Western Front. This poem is called The Sunken Lane, which was a, an important geographical feature on the Western Front. And if you see it, the idea that it could have been used as a sheltering place seems very strange. The sunken lane is dedicated to Private Harry Reid, who died on Christmas Eve 1915. 
He was described as a horseman from a farm near Driffield in East Yorkshire on my mother's side of the family, the sunken lane. I mean to walk down the sunken lane where the dead are once more trying to assemble in the dark. By the light of Bavarian gentians, I'll be looking for the dugout at the entrance to the mine and then descend the deepest shaft where the ancient ordnance sweats and waits implacably for zero hour beneath the ridge. I will surface in the middle of the wood while the teams of machine gunners sleep with their heads on the barrels just for a minute, a minute, before the beginning, the end, the balloon going up, the whistles like a cloud of nightingales. I carry a letter from home, the cigarette case that will save me, a picture of you all the time in the world to stroke your face while you are waiting, Robinette or English Rose, so patiently there at the edge of the village where wildflowers grow by the road. This is a, a slightly longer piece called The Chase and it's set somewhere in the kind of badlands of the West Midlands. Um, no particular place is being impugned here. Um, but the chase, you know, is an area of what used to be common land, the chase, and it has one of those big old kind of Worthington, Michelin, Butler style pubs, vast palaces of drink, which have largely fallen from use, fashion, and in some cases existence. And this is about some people who are having a meeting there. The chase. Hell might have a function room like this where gravy fights it out with Harpic. A mock Tudor Midland Roadhouse, 30s built to meet the passing trade long since diverted down the bypass. It fell on hard times, then on harder ones, and kept on falling through false floors, down shafts of optimistic anaglypta, past the cheap and cheerful weddings, underbooked conventions, lingerie events, and charismatic preachers braving out the years God turned his face away. The old place stands in Hawthorne scrub beside the nibbled chase, its car park dogged by doggers. It must long for arson. What it gets of damaged veterans and others of uncertain provenance would be werewolves left behind to serve the cause from bunkers dug beneath allotments, their St. George's flags announce our England no more. There will be those who speak, who bring fraternal greetings from our Flemish friends, and those who listen with a hope so long deferred it is immortal. What began one pale late summer evening here will end when darkness brings instructions to prepare for the eternal soon. The Ur-time worship to the true theology where things are otherwise. But in the meantime, minutes must be taken, grist to the banal resentments, nudges, localised atrocities, as omens of the greater cause, and let no one forget that there are windows to be licked and public discourse to be joined until, on average 18 seconds in, the calls cut off at Radio Chase. It's where the middle of the Midlands is again. These are the relatives you never see now since your parents' generation died. You do remember, yes, the awkwardness. A funeral tea held somewhere like the chase that might have even been the chase. A fly blown nowhere, birches, ponds, with HGVs parked up in laybys full of rubbish and a sense of give or take this could be any time since 1931. And someone's husband joining you outside to smoke, assuming you'd agree with his shy, smiling bigotry about our friends from the subcontinent. You can't remember what you said. You can, and it was nothing, while he stood his ground there in the car park. And if he sensed you were clenching with embarrassment, you couldn't tell. He'd made his point, 
while you declared you'd better make a start, and he advised what roads you should avoid, and never blinked while here in hindsight you're still blinking at the shame of it when accident has brought you back down these unfashionable routes and then contrived the need to stop and get a sandwich. Sunday afternoon in Albion's excluded middle. The meeting is concluding on the far side of the corridor. The literature is all there at the back, beside the runes and ornamental daggers that make lovely gifts. To say it takes all sorts may be a fallacy, but here they are, and here you are again. The sandwich comes. You watch them load their tat and nonsense back into the knacker's van. You are confused by a persistent disbelief that this can be the case, this levee of Pujardists dawdling by their cars till those with homes to go to go there, and those with holes hole up to count the days till their black sun rises on this honest plain of midland ash and spoil, and their inheritance is saved from everyone, including you. Too bored to laugh, too tired to cry. You think these people do not matter, then they do. This one is called Jaguar, and it takes place in Mexico City, which is a rather hallucinogenic place in its own right. And uh, I guess it's about undischarged energy. The Jaguar is one of the kind of the two great mythic animals of the Mexican imagination, the other of course being the eagle. This is a Jaguar who is seen sitting having a coffee and then starting to drink beer. Jaguar. A man with the head of a Jaguar sits at the bar. He has read all the papers and drunk too much coffee and still it is early. But now, by the patterns he plays with his hands on the brass bar rail and the twin bass drum pedals of his great hind paws on the rung of the bar stool, what he can hear is a different music. Neither the apologies delivered by the barrel organs, nor the vaults of the narco corridos, nor yet the appeals for vengeance in the name of love preferred by the stations that cleaners and cab drivers turn to when searching for something resembling silence in Mexico City. The Jaguar purrs, he growls, and on the stroke of noon he sips Pacifico and goes on waiting. The waves of percussion surge and hold, while chicas and matrons, the bankers, the beggars, the cops and the military arm to the teeth pass up and down the magic radii extending from Zocalo to the furthest slum. So who will dare to ask the Jaguar if he performs requests and might be called upon to sing aloud the song that ripples through the fur and muscle his white shirt and sober charcoal suit cannot disguise the song of death and paradise. Will you? As if the Jaguar can tell merely by glancing your way as you pass, he shakes his head just barely, and his golden stare, although it means you are unworthy even to appeal to hear that secret music, nonetheless agrees that all of us are born to live in hope despite the mounting evidence. Um, maybe something slightly more light-hearted now. Well, relatively more light-hearted. When I was in infant school, one of my favourite books in the class library was called Little Pig Finnegan. It was a short, beautifully illustrated story about a young pig living in Ireland who overheard the farmer talking about the fact that since Finnegan had a straight tail, he would have to go for a bacon. And Finnegan didn't like the sound of this and decided to run away. And his sister Biddy gave him some mints wrapped up in a handkerchief to take with him. And off he went over the hills and far away. And I still like the story and had it tracked down a few years ago. But I felt the need to have a, a new version of it to revisit the story. 
in a more Tarantino-esque style. <laughs> so this is Little Pig Finnegan. I should say that no pigs were injured in the writing of this poem. <laughs> the farmer was talking and Little Pig Finnegan heard what the farmer had said. That one's tail is too straight and there's no time to wait. So he's going for bacon instead, Trala. He's going for bacon instead. When your pig saw his ass in a large looking glass, the farmer had not been mistaken. Young Finnegan balked at the thought he'd be smoked, and he felt all alone and forsaken. I'm going for bacon instead, Trella. I'm going for bacon instead. But his big sister Bridget, that's Biddy for short, said, You'll be for breakfast if ever you call, so I'm putting these mitts in this bundle I brought. Now run away, Finnegan, run, run away on your little pig legs, or you'll be the bacon that goes with the eggs. The bacon that goes with the eggs, Trella. The bacon that goes with the eggs. So Finnegan fled with a price on his head, or in fact on his little straight tail, away, far away till the break of day. When he came to a farm, a wee place of great charm, where the farmer's wife beckoned him in, Trella. The farmer's wife beckoned him in. She fed him and bathed him and fed him again, till the sleep rose up over his head. She put on the white coat and she cut his wee throat, and he thought, Holy fuck, now I'm dead, Trella. <laughs> so he thought, Holy fuck, now I'm dead. Then she minced him for sausage instead, Trella. She minced him for sausage instead. <laughs> sort of garden poem um, of a somber, well as you might have guessed, fairly somber kind called I Found My Way. I wouldn't care to speculate on what this is actually about. I think it might be about several things, but see for yourselves. I found my way. I found my way, the worse for drink, through petal storms, the white, the pink, the place was all significance. The goddess in the jasmine shade, sequestered in her green romance, arch on arch in deep recession, inaudibly the fountains played. The seasons fled as England slept, and I could not, a trespasser on ground I'd owned. What business underwrote my being there? Yet an appointment must be kept. The roses hooded for the frost, like hangman, saw that I was lost. And yet this place was all I knew, while how I came there, and for what, had never troubled me till now. But now I walked that blessed plot, green avenue by avenue, past royal rows and bergamots, in residence yet passing through. So what conclusion should I draw from this arboreal baroque, when every way led only here, whose silence waited like a clock. And how should I inquire within to learn the nature of the sin for which I was arraigned? And then I saw, this is the centre of the rose, an empty sepulchre designed to quench the tongue and close the mind, the perfect, heartless, silent O. Oh, she never cares to speak in prose, where there is neither stay, nor go, nor any means of saying so. I was asked to write a story about the effect of reading, about the imaginative effects of reading, a poem rather, about the imaginative effects of reading. The poem is called, It Says Here. We all, those of us who are teachers, and I imagine there are a few of us here today, all at some level can sense the notion that reading is good for you. But that's not entirely why we do it. It's not, that doesn't encompass the peculiar pleasures we derive from it. Anyway, it says here that the way through the woods runs out in a blizzard, that the ocean does not, is eternal. And still for a while you may cross the great ice dome by dog sled, though at your own risk. That the book you are reading is one of a kind, that 
its door opens inwards and cannot be closed, that the train going over a bridge at night has somewhere to get to, that even the driver, heroic and faceless and bathed in the heat from the firebox, never discovers, that the sky is a page where, with a flourish, the birds write the truth in invisible ink, and the eye is too slow to be certain that this word and that word are never to meet, or the poem will sicken and die. That when you glance up from your reading, the rivers divide and divide, and at last you step down at a halt in the woods with its name painted over, and there in the evening the bride and the gamekeeper wait with their faces averted, wait for the signal to shift and the lamp to glow red and a train to arrive, but not yet, and not yet, that though this is August, the snow is beginning, you blink and the woods are half buried in snow and the traveller is gone. And as for the fire and the rose that it now seems you set out in search of, that is a different story, or so it says here. <coughs> Anger. Scarcely are we introduced and you're in residence. You say I know what's good for me. The light in here is too bright, so I make it dingy, 30 watts, the 50s, with a smell of damp and cats and cabbage. Can I feel the imminence a little bit? Just try and stop me. On the hour, somewhere upstairs, the argument that never ends is back between the shouts of rage and the persistent quiet tone that could provoke a murder but not yet, because there is a piece of this establishment that anger has not claimed and has not found until now, a place to sit and listen halfway up the stairs. You count the steps for me, that's right. From there, I get to exercise a choice and finally be overwhelmed by my inheritance. So now, the inexhaustible despair, the whispers of the screams are mine. By day, these lunatics are deadpan, though dry-mouthed with rage. By night, they break new ground in the monotony of pain. But thank you for advancing me this wisdom, which on second glance appears to be a debt cannot be repaid, while I no longer occupy my body only, but a corner of the airless room you've locked me in to celebrate the old religion too, its vinegar and loathing, plenitude. So what's wrong now, I ask? It's always you, 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 you say. Why is that? Tell me, tell me. And, um, uh, a dog rough ballad called The Ballad of Springfield Park, which has some bearing on the events through which we are living, to put it more precisely than that. Sorry, to put it more precisely than that. The Ballad of Springfield Park. It's my local park where people go jogging, not me, as you may infer. Last night I met a running man whose head was all ablaze. He said, I like my brain to burn, whatever reason says. So let the cerebellum roast and every synapse fry. If you will run beside me now, then I shall tell you why. I choose to be unreasoning, for thinking is too hard. And so I took the bolder course and dipped my head in lard. And then ignored the experts who advised me not to light it. But they deny me liberty, so I am bound to fight it. They tell me there is no benefit in my incineration, but it's a sacrifice I make to liberate the nation from the thraldom of rationality and all that other shite. Does this appeal to you? Then let me offer you a light, and we can burn together like bright beacons in the dark. I smiled and shook my head, and he ran screaming through the park to where the others were assembled in a mighty blazing host. They waved the mail and the express and drank a petrol toast. They'd struck a match for liberty with a patriot's panache, and then they went out one by one and crumbled into ash. 
And I'm going to read two more to finish. In the spring of 1989, I was in Berlin on a, a sort of poet's visit to Berlin, half a dozen of us published by Blood Axe at that time, and we attended a translation workshop in an old hunting lodge near Glienicke, very close to the bridge where, you know, famously spies were exchanged. And it was a very beautiful place, but mad in the sense that the Berlin Wall ran right down the middle of one of the stable blocks. And while you were taking the air in the mornings and evenings, you could see East German patrol boats nosing about on a beautiful lake. And also early one morning, I heard a nightingale. Um, we shouldn't have been there in the morning, but it was. And the poem is called Du Nachtigall, and it quotes from the medieval German poet Vogelweider, who wrote the great poem Unter den Linden, a beautiful erotic love song, and I've just stolen the chorus line for my purposes. Du Nachtigall. Schöne Sankt Du Nachtigall, in the willow trees at dawn, by the Glienicke See, the blue song inexhaustible. If I could hear, so could the Vopos, nosing in their grim grey boats, down among the rushes, oh. It was the shore of history, another lake where legions drown, we told each other with no words. Schöne Sankt Du Nachtigall. We told each other with no words. The saturated alphabet came flowing to no end at all. Schöne Sankt Du Nachtigall. That history is for the birds. And thank you very much for listening. As I say, it's a great pleasure to have been reading here. Finally, I read a poem called The Calm. It's not of any significance, but this takes place at the mouth of the River Tyne. Uh, but it could be any comparable setting. The Calm. At the mouth of the river, moon, stars, and arctic calm. The twin lights at the end of the piers revolving with the smoothness we expect of supernatural machinery. Seen from down here on the beach, the harboured ocean slowly tilts like a mirror discreetly manhandled by night from the giant room it was supposed to occupy forever. The mind says, now, but the stars on their angelic gimbals roll and fade a tide of constellations breaking nowhere every night about this time. Strike up the band. In the tumble down bar, the singer has fallen from stardom and grace. But though her interests nowadays are wholly secular, she can still refer back to the angels. And knowing that song, we share a moment with the saved before we leave to make the crossing. No captain, no ferry, but cross we shall, believe you me. Thank you very much.